Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the, flag the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. And Jenny, could you do roll call, please? Sure. Donna Corbin Pavitsky? Here. Kevin Zorda? Here. Virginia Higley? Here. Carrie Ann Howe? Here. Jane Smith? Robert Chagnon? Marie Bisner? Here. Marcy Talisio? Here. And Robert Hendrickson? Okay, fine. So I'd like to seat uh, Marcy and Marie. Okay. Okay. So we're good for there. Um, yep. so, so I do know we have Savannah Nicole. Uh oh, sorry, I want to say your last name. <laughs> yes. So, so uh, I, I would like to introduce uh, Savannah Nicole Vialba. There we um, go. Sorry about that. Uh, assistant town planner and hopefully our new wetlands agent. Of course, you will have to appoint her, but for the meantime, she's been doing a lot of training. She's done the inland wetlands training and aquifer protection, and she has some background. And actually, Nicole, I'll let you introduce yourself if you want. Hi, everyone. My name is Savannah Nicole Vialba. I have a hyphenated name like Carrie Ann. I graduated from the University of Connecticut in 2018 with my bachelor's, and I graduated this May with my master's in urban and environmental policy and planning from Tufts University. So I'm a Connecticut native, and I'm very excited to be in Enfield and working with you all. Great. Congratulations. Welcome to our Welcome team. Welcome to Enfield. Thank yeah. you. Welcome. Very nice. Um, I just saw um, Bob Hendrickson get on. Is he on? Yes. He's here. <laughs> yes, I am. Yes, I am. Hi, Bob. Hi, uh, everyone. Hi. Um, so now uh, we executive session on the agenda that we don't have anything. So that's um, correspondence. We really just have our paperwork for our items on the agenda. Um, agents correspondence. Does any anybody have anything they like to add? I did get the email from the state that they have the new uh, training available online. Did everybody else get that too? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the deep thing. Yep, we did. Yep. And, and excuse me, I, be I believe that's what Savannah and Nicole just took. And yeah. I believe it was like an eight hour class. Is that correct? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, eight hours. And you have 60 days doing to it? take it, I think. Yeah, 60 days from when you register to complete it. Okay. Yeah, I remember that. Uh, that's great. Thank you, Carrie Ann. Um, next is our approval of minutes for May 5th. <coughs> I'll make a motion. We I uh, move to approve, approve the, the minutes of May 5th. Oh. <laughs> so I think Kevin was Kevin was going to approve them. So, Jenny, you want to second them? I'll second them. Sorry, Kevin. It's all right. <laughs> Thank you. Can we have roll call? Donna? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Virginia Stain? Carrie Ann? Stain. Jane isn't here. Sorry. Um, Marie? Except. Marcy? Okay. Uh, so uh, four in favor, two abstain, motion passes. Mm -hmm. We're good. We don't have anything for old business. So new business would be our uh, wetland permit IW605-118 Hazard Avenue. is application for a permit to conduct a regulated activity. That bill plus or minus 4,877 square feet of existing wetlands on land in the 100 foot up on the review area to construct a two story 29,000 square foot assisted living facility with associated improvements on the property known as 118 Hazard Avenue, map 065, lot 059, 
Zone R44, Ward Manor, LLC, Owner Kaplan Development Group, um, LLC. So are they on? I, I need to abstain on this. All right. Uh, off the meeting. When you guys are done with this, if somebody can give me a call and I'll come back on. Lori, yeah. you have my number Sounds right. Good. good evening, everybody. I don't know if you can all hear me. Uh, Jeff Board with Bowler Engineering. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Um, professional engineer in the state of Connecticut. I uh, work at Bowler Engineering at 16 Old Forge Road in Rocky Hill, Connecticut, uh, here on behalf of Kaplan Development Group for our property located at 118 Hazard Ave. Uh, here with us this evening from our project team was Eric Davison from Davison Environmental. Uh, you guys may remember Eric from when we were uh, at your commission a few weeks back for a wetland map amendment. Uh, oh. Eric, environmental biologist and a professional soil and wetland scientist. Um, and on behalf of our project team, you know, I want to, you know, we do appreciate your time and effort putting these virtual meetings together. Um, I know from our standpoint, it's, it's great that you guys are continuing to do this and move the projects along. So thank you for that. Um, Lori, I don't know if it's easier for me to just share my screen with the, um, the PowerPoint here or with our, with our PDFs or if you have it pulled up already. No, I, uh, if you could share it, that would be great. You should be able to. Okay, let me see here. I think you just have to click share screen down at the bottom. Yeah. Okay. All right, let me see here, share. All right, you guys looking at the PDF I have up on screen here? Yep. Yep. All right, so basically, yes. Just an existing conditions aerial uh, titled Wetland Delineation EX01 uh, with a date, revised data 6 4 2020, just to kind of orient you to the site. Um, the site is 118 Hazard Avenue. Uh, north is to the right hand side of the page here for reference. I believe uh, it's bordered to the north by Hazard Ave. Across the street is the Country Diner, and then there's a salon, uh, I believe, in this location here. Um, bordered to the south by Middle Road. Uh, in the residential portion back here. Um, and then there's existing farmlands to the west and a vacant lot to the east as well. Um, basically, our site is unique in the sense that it's split into two zones. One of the zones is on BP or business professional, and that's on the northern portion of the lot, judging by the line that runs through the existing farm field to the south. And then R44 zone up along Middle Turnpike to the rear of the lot. Uh, total acreage is 19.44 acres, um, and right now it's currently an existing farm field or agricultural field and a wooded lot to the northern area um, with a small area of elevation, kind of where I'll get into the development area uh, in this corner here in the northeastern portion of the site. Uh, existing topography generally slopes from south to north, uh, northwest towards Hazard Avenue up in this area here uh, near Wetland Flag 110 in the culverts. Um, and, and as you'll see, when we get into the design elements, we are looking to maintain and mimic those existing drainage patterns that are currently on site today. Uh, with that, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background as far as how we got to where we are. Uh, project team last year attended an applications review team meeting uh, with town staff to go over our development plans, uh, solicit in input from town staff. Uh, we have incorporated a lot of those comments into tonight's presentation. Uh, which I'll get to momentarily. Um, we also did, again, as I mentioned earlier, receive a wetland map amendment approval uh, just about mm -hmm. weeks ago from your commission. Uh, and, and we have amended the plan to add the additional two flags that were discussed at the previous meeting. So all the new, all the plans that you received recently have, have those two extra flags shown. Um, with that, I know Eric's here. Uh, he had prepared a wetlands report and a functions and values assessment um, that was submitted to your commission. Um, and Eric, I don't know if you are, if you're on yet, uh, if you wanted to take over and discuss some of the, uh, the summary of your report here. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Jeff. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes, we can. Okay. Uh, that's Eric Davison. Um, as Jeff mentioned, and as you are aware, um, uh, we completed the wetland boundary amendment and, um, just wanted to briefly go through the wetlands that are on the site. Um, uh, if you look at the map that's in front of you here, um, actually, Jeff, could I share my screen? That might be even easier here. Uh, yep. 
Let me see here. I think I can do it here. Can I? Can everyone see this? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to scroll to my my map here. This is a map that's included in my report, just a simplified illustration of the wetlands that are on site, so I can just discuss them briefly. Um, as you can see from this uh, uh, inset, there's four wetlands on the site. Wetland one is on the east side. It's a small isolated wetland that just, just touches the eastern site boundary. Um, and it continues off to the east onto the neighboring property. property. It, it, again, it's isolated. Um, it's a small depressional wetland um, that doesn't go very far beyond what you see mapped here. Um, uh, 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 highlighted in green. Wetland two is the small isolated wetland that was the uh, topic of discussion during the wetland boundary amendment. Um, it, it's uh, just north of the area that we discussed uh, in terms of um, an area that was flooded uh, and investigated for additional wetlands. So it's just north of that. Um, it's a very small wetland, uh, basically four or five flags surrounding it. It's about 130 square feet. It's just a very small depression on the landscape that has a wetland hydrology. Uh, wetland three is a larger isolated wetland that is very close to uh, Hazard Avenue. You can see it from the road there. Um, it's a, a, a more deeply ponded wetland. Um, it, it's, uh, it's forested. Um, it does not have a direct connection to the other wetlands, but there is sort of a, a rough overflow to wetland four, uh, where they ditched the southern end of wetland three and the northern end of wetland four to kind of connect those on a landscape feature, but it's essentially isolated. And wetland four is the main wetland um, on the property. It's, it's a large wetland that, as you can see, extends south to the cornfield, west to the, uh, um, agricultural land that borders the western side of the site and then it runs as you can see in green uh runs along the edge of hazard avenue in a ditch um uh, that section picks up flow from hazard avenue that discharges into that ditch and eventually flows into the wetland um so those are the four wetlands that are on the property um jeff i don't know if you want me to go through um, the vernal pool information and the rest of the information, or did you want to talk about the site? Oh, uh, that would be fine if you want to continue talking about that just as it deals with existing conditions. Okay, if you want to, you can jump back, Jeff, if you want to show your screen again. Yeah, my controls disappeared here, so I don't know if there's a way to exit out. I'm still showing. Oh, here we go. I think I got it here. There you go. Okay. Um, so just um, moving on to the uh, to the vernal pool survey because uh, that was a topic of discussion during um, the wetland boundary amendment. Um, we conducted a vernal pool survey uh, during March and April of this year, um, and the results are included in, in my report um, in section four. I'll just summarize them here. Um, we surveyed all four wetlands for vernal pools, um, and the uh, single area we saw activity was wetland three, uh, which is uh, shown here with this uh, call out that Jeff has here, a vernal pool with a small area highlighted in blue. That's wetland three. And the vernal pool is basically encompasses that, that entire section of, of wetland three. Um, as you may or may not have noted, if you read my report, um, we only saw one indicator species in that vernal pool was the wood frog, and we only saw two egg masses in the pool. So uh, it has low diversity, it has only one species, and it has very low productivity. Um, it, there's a very uh, detailed uh, assessment of the habitat conditions surrounding that pool and discussion on the habitat condition. I'll, I'll just summarize it here, but there's gonna be more detail in my report. If I uh, go too quickly over anything, I can, I can elaborate. But basically the idea behind vernal pool function is uh, the indicator species use the pool to breed in. They're only in the pool for, you know, four to six weeks uh, in a season. Uh, the adults and the juveniles uh, and developing larvae are only in the pool for a period of two months, um, give or take. 
So the rest of the year, they're using terrestrial, non-wetland, mostly non-wetland habitats, and mostly forested habitats for uh, basically their uh, habitat beyond breeding. Uh, most of these species, especially the two that we were searching for and the one that we found, the wood frog, um, use terrestrial forest uh, surrounding the breeding pool. Um, so we did the assessment that um, you may be familiar with using uh, what we call the best development practices document that was developed by Calhoun and Clemens. And it basically analyzes the habitat conditions in two zones, the first being 100 feet from the pool and the second zone being 100 to 750 feet from the pool. And I can share, actually, Jeff, why don't I share my screen again just to show that. Um, let's see. And I show this uh, landscape analysis, I'm just gonna scroll down here, show this landscape analysis here on my figure three, if everybody can see that. Mm -hmm. And what this shows here in green are the two habitat zones, the 100 foot zone surrounding the pool itself and the 750 foot zone um, that uh, extends out, the outer green boundary that extends out north of Hazard Avenue and south towards Middle Road. Um, if you look at the calculations that I show on the previous page, that's this table here. Basically what we um, learn is that the forest cover in the two conservation zones that are critical for their survival, um, what we look for is a high level of forest cover in those zones, a high percentage of forest cover. And in this case, the percentage of forest cover is low. Uh, the location of Hazard Ave is particularly uh, impactful because it's a high traffic road that basically uh, eliminates any potential for effective migration to and from the pool from the north side of Hazard Avenue. It effectively cuts off any available forest on the north side of Hazard Avenue and that's the area that I've hashed in orange on the north side of Hazard Avenue. That's forest within the habitat zones that we would essentially consider unavailable just because uh, migration across that road is, is, is so treacherous and would result in high levels of mortality over time. So the primary habitat is really the, the forest patch that's south of the pool shown in brown. Um, so when we look at the landscape analysis between the uh, location of Hazard Avenue, the high traffic on Hazard Avenue, uh, the limited forest cover that's available around the pool, and um, and also the intensive agriculture, which doesn't really provide terrestrial habitat in the long term. All of that basically explains why the pool uh, is low in productivity. Um, it's generally what we see when we see a landscape in this condition. We see pools with very low productivity. Um, just going back to the uh, calculations, if you look, um, what I was describing here earlier where it says forest functionally unavailable north of Hazard Avenue, that forest block north of Hazard Avenue is 27% of that outer habitat zone out to 750 feet. As you can see, development uh, occupies about 12%. Uh, available forest that uh, surrounds the southern end of the pool occupies about 26%, and then the remaining area, 34% is agriculture. So generally what we look for is forest cover in that outer 750 foot zone of 75%, but a minimum of 50% for a functional pool, but for uh, more significant pools, we look for a cover of 75% or more. So you can see based on these numbers, that the habitat is fragmented and impacted and to me that that explains why the, the pool has such low productivity um, i'm going to just go back to just uh screen here yeah and i'll share mine again guys with respect to uh breeding habitat and the other wetlands i'll just touch on that quickly uh wetlands one uh and wetland two did not have standing water during um, the majority of the breeding season. They did fill in late March, but then they drained again pretty quickly. So during the period where the deposition occurred in March, early March, 
Um, there was no water in those pools. So the hydrology in wetland one and two is just too, um, um, it's flashy. Uh, it's the hydro period is just too short. Um, the duration of flooding is too short. Wetland four had some uh, flooding in the initial um, survey when, right before egg mass deposition and during egg mass deposition, there were some flooded areas uh, in wetland four on the north side, right by um, Hazard Avenue and also on the west side, right by the um, uh, agricultural land. So those were two areas that were flooded. Um, there were no egg masses present. And then on the following visit, those areas drained. Uh, so again, that, that flooding regime just doesn't support breeding. They, they, those areas did refill with water, but again, the hydro period uh, in those areas is temporarily flooded as opposed to seasonally flooded, which is what the indicator species require. So um, again, wetland four just didn't have the, uh, the hydrology to support breeding. Um, uh, with that, I think I can, uh, I'll give it back to Jeff and let him talk about the site plan and then we can talk about uh, the mitigation uh, plan after that. Sounds good. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, just flip to what's loading up here. It's a colorized version of the site plan that you guys have in front of you, um, where we show in color the building, the landscaping, pavement. Um, and we have that on top of an aerial with the existing wetland shown as well. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, we are here before you for an assisted living facility. Uh, the end user is All American Assisted Living. Um, Kaplan Development has several of these developments in New England, I believe two in Massachusetts, one in New Hampshire that are both 98% occupancy, if not higher. Um, so the, the model has been tried and tested, and this is their first um, project in Connecticut um, that they were coming into. So they're excited to be here. They're excited to put forth this application. Um, a lot of what goes into these, this is a two-story facility with 58 units totaling approximately 54,000 square feet. The ground footprint itself is 29,000 square feet. And as I get into some of the site plan features, you'll see that they take a lot of care into providing a service that gives their, their occupants a lot of uh, amenities um, to go with, with the, uh, the assisted living here. So just to orient you again, Hazard Avenue is to the right-hand side of the page, which is north. Uh, we did propose a 30-foot full-access driveway onto Hazard Avenue that lines up with the um, driveway across the street for traffic purposes. Um, we are proposing 50, 69 parking spaces on site, uh, the front of which will be used mostly for visitors and guests, and the back will be mostly used for employees. Um, at the ART meeting, just talking access, we had not originally proposed a driveway connection out to Middle Road. Um, and what had come up from the fire marshal was that we should really think to include a, an emergency access drive. So we've, we've tried to do that, um, being as minimally invasive as we can to that back farm area, um, an agricultural area that exists. And what we did was a proposed gravel drive that will have bollards and a chain blocking off the driveway entrance at Middle Road. And it's a similar um, connection if you go down the street a bit to the west uh, that they have, I believe it's for Hartford Hospital, uh, has an outpatient facility there. There's a building, there a couple lots away that has a very similar uh, situation for emergency access, which would just be the fire department would have access to a knockbox um, on that lock itself. Um, back to the site plan here. Uh, there is a drop-off area in the front and did talk about the emergency pavers in the rear was also another thing that came up from the fire marshal, which we did add um, after our ART meeting. Uh, we do have a dumpster area and a service area for drop-offs located in the front here. And I guess, big picture, the site is unique in the sense that what we had just showed you, given all the wetland areas and the way that this program and this, this building fits on here, it is rather a unique program with regards to the building type and the size and the way that we laid this out was strategically placed to try to avoid as much of the direct impacts as we could while still respecting the program as much as we could. And we ended up going through multiple iterations where the building was rotated along hazard, the building was shifted up to the west a bit. And this is really the where it wants to sit. Um, We've, we've tried to minimize it best we could, and as we'll get into momentarily, there is an area that we're proposing 
uh, for mitigation as well as um, an agricultural easement uh, that we have an exhibit to show you as well. Um, let's see here. There is one ground mounted sign. It's a double sided sign at 19 square feet for 38 square feet in total, which falls under the allowable regulations. Um, one of the other things worth mentioning is that this is fully compliant with the zoning regulations. We are not seeking any variances. Um, everything falls under the, the allowable limits. Um, and, and as I get into stormwater, you'll see what we've tried to do as well to mimic existing drainage patterns. Um, we did have areas to the rear that we had designated as snow storage areas. What we wanted to do was provide some of the parking spaces in the back here, um, the opportunity to store the snow so that ultimately when it melts, it makes its way into the catch basins and ultimately is treated through the underground infiltration system that I will get into. Um, another thing that was interesting, and I know it's come up on a lot of other wetlands applications, was to go along with the amenities, it kind of goes hand in hand to have kind of informative placards with regards to wetland information, um, you know, teaching residents about certain plants that may be in the area if they're sitting on a bench to the, the southwest there overlooking the wetlands. You know, there'd be placards placed every so often to kind of teach and, and kind of provide guidance on, on what they're looking at. And it's kind of a unique thing that benefits not only the residents, but, but the Inland Wetlands Commission in, in, in a way. Um, I know they, the, the residents would certainly appreciate it. Um, and then with regards to the, the wetland displacement, as, as Eric was getting into earlier, the area that's most impacted is this little isolated pocket of wetlands right here in the parking area, right as you come in onto Hazard Avenue or off of Hazard Avenue. And then there's a, an area in the back that the driveway circulates around the building to connect the two parking lots. That's where the majority of the, the wetland impacts are taking place. Um, we did look at different alternatives on, you know, separating those lots and, and connecting to middle. And it, it goes to show the, uh, the connection to middle is not feasible due to the fact that you're not able to make a permanent connection um, without seeking a variance and there's no hardship in our case. So we would not get that approval. Um, so that, that's kind of how we ended up with the orientation, the way it's sitting. And what's not shown on this exhibit is the, the 60 foot front yard setback, which is special to the assisted living facility and a 50 foot side yard setback. So we've respected both of those, but we've kept it as tight to the front property line and the side property line as we can to, to minimize that impact to the rear. Um, from a site standpoint, that's pretty much what I wanted to go through. And, and, here, and this will kind of be me looking at this with Eric here. Um, this is a, essentially a wetland mitigation exhibit that we prepared. And what you're looking at is a plan that's on top of our current grading and stormwater plan. And the area in red that's highlighted is an area that we chose for providing mitigation or wetland creation of that area. Um, Eric had gone out in the field, uh, looked at it. We came up with the most ideal spot and Eric can get into the technical components of, of why we chose this spot and, and uh, what, it, what it's gonna do for us here. But essentially it's, it's a two to one mitigation. So what we are filling, we're just shy, we're just shy of 5,000 square feet of direct impacts to the wetlands. And what we're gonna be putting back is just over 10,000 square feet of area. Um, so Eric, I don't know if you wanna to touch on any of the, the mitigation portion of your report as far as plantings and, and what goes into selecting a, a location like this. Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, get, getting into mitigation. Um, first, let me go back to the vernal pool. <clears throat> um, the document I referenced that we use to assess the vernal pool, uh, uh, again, if you're familiar with it or not, it's called Best Development Practices uh, Conserving Pool Breeding Amphibians in Residential and Commercial Developments. Um, it, was, uh, it was developed by the Metropolitan Conservation Alliance uh, in 2002. Um, I'm a firm believer in that document and using it to as, as sort of a baseline assessment of the value of a vernal pool. Um, just as a quick background, I worked for the Metropolitan Conservation Alliance for several years uh, and we applied uh, the guidelines and assessment uh, tools in that manual for townwide vernal pool surveys in a number of towns in Connecticut, including Windsor, uh, and, in, and, and in New York as well. So I'm a firm believer in that, in that guidance document, and it has a number of recommendations on 
how you protect vernal pools when you're proposing a development around uh, around a vernal pool. So, you know, to be blunt, um, this development um, does not comply with the recommendations of that guidance document. Um, the primary uh, guidance is that no development occur within 100 feet of a vernal pool. In this case, obviously, we already have a significant development feature in that 100 foot zone that's Hazard Avenue. But as you can see from the site plans, there's grading and uh, disturbance uh, close to this vernal pool. Um, but I think what we're looking at here, when you see a vernal pool with one indicator species and two egg masses, that's an incredibly small population. Um, that's a population that's incredibly stressed. Um, I think, again, the landscape condition explains why this is a stressed population and a degraded population. But when you have a population that's in a stressed condition, uh, there's just no way that um, a project like this will uh, ultimately sort of seal the fate of what remains uh, functional in this pool because the development's gonna lie in in my opinion, in the little patch of forest that probably supports uh, the few wood frogs that we have on the site. But I also you know, wanted to say that um, when you have a pool like this, two egg masses, even with the, the small amount of variability you can get in breeding from year to year, when you have a, when you have a population like this and you have a landscape like this, it's very likely that this pool will not survive if nothing happens on this site or if you were to do a smaller development on this site, if it were to occur in this patch of forest, um, that would likely, again, take out what's remaining of the, the, the habitat that these animals are using. I'm not trying to say this to justify one project versus another. I just think anything you do in this small forest patch will eliminate this pool. And also I, I speculate that no activity on this site over time, unless you have a drastic change in traffic patterns or landscape condition where agricultural uh, land converts to forest land, you're not going to see this pool recover. Um, one of the main reasons for that is that it is fairly isolated on the landscape. We've seen degraded pools um, recover when they have uh, a source population from another pool where animals can leave that pool um, and colonize this pool and basically can provide additional breeding individuals and support a pool that is um, that is basically a, what we call a sink as opposed to a source. Um, but in this landscape, I just don't see any pools in the near vicinity that um, where there's a migratory corridor between these pools. So that's sort of the long and short of it um, with uh, the vernal pool impacts. Uh, I just want to be clear that this development doesn't comply with the BDP guidelines. And you know, almost anything you do in this small patch, um, you'd have a difficulty complying with. Um, I do think, aside from the vernal pool impacts, we're able to mitigate, mitigate just the wetland impacts themselves, merely because in these glacial lacustrine soils and with this agricultural uh, activity that's on the south end of wetland four, it's a prime location to create wetlands. Uh, that edge of the, of the wetland where we, Jeff is showing highlighted in red, um, it's unforested, um, it's very low lying, it would require just a minor excavation of material, installation of, of uh, wetland uh, appropriate topsoil, and then seeding and planting. And I've uh, outlined that in my report, uh, provided a sequence for <clears throat> establishing a, wet, a new wetland area in there that would be, as Jeff mentioned, a two to one mitigation for wetlands impacted versus wetlands created. It's a good location to create wetlands. I think it's a, a, an area where wetland creation is likely to be successful. So I think we, we, can, we can create uh, wetlands uh, fairly easily uh, on this site. I did also have a number of recommendations just because aside from the direct impacts to wetland four, we've also got a lot of grading near wetlands. And so it, I won't go through each one, but if you look at section five of my report, I have recommendations in there on alternative measures for erosion and sedimentation control. And if something like this were to get approved that, you know, that, that I would recommend strongly a third party inspector that's independent from the, you know, from, the applicant to inspect the uh, erosion sedimentation controls just to make sure there are no issues during construction. Um, uh, there are a, a few other recommendations I have in in my um, 
in my report again in section five. I, uh, I, but I think the biggest mitigation measure that we uh, came up with, which isn't quite wetland related, but I think speaks to the overall natural resource value of the property is that uh, we did get the applicant to commit to taking the remaining uh, agricultural land that's now a cornfield um, and putting that approximately nine acres into a permanent agricultural easement, which would mean that no future development could occur in that area and it would could only be used for farming. <clears throat> so other than the access road and the small mitigation area, that remaining nine acres or so would be uh, uh, agricultural land in perpetuity. And when I see a site like this, that's under pressure from, you know, commercial development and residential development. And it, to me, you know, agricultural use uh, seems to be one of the most significant natural resource values of the site. The soils in that cornfield are both uh, prime, what we call prime farmland soils and soils of statewide importance. So they're, they're soils that have been designated by the state department of agriculture as important for farming just because they're highly productive for uh for cropland so <clears throat> again it's not your traditional mitigation proposal but i do think that nine acres of uh, agricultural easement is significant um just from an overall natural resource perspective uh i think at this point it might be useful to take some questions since i think we've uh, uh given on, over a lot of information here that sounds good. Um, thanks for the information. Um, it looks like a nice project. You did a great job in trying to um, help protect the wetlands and that. The other question is, what are, you, what are you doing for the farmland, you know, the abutting property? Could you just review that a little bit? I know there's concern with the farmland. Yeah, so so basically with the, as Eric just discussed, in the, the southwestern corner, there's this nine acres of land that we're going to be giving an easement back just to keep that as agricultural use. I know the adjacent farmer um, was farming this land, or the adjacent landowner was farming our piece of land. Um, had some concerns regarding, um, you know, drainage and, and what we're doing to his wetlands on the west side of the property. Um, with, with regards to the drainage, which I was getting into next, the uh, peak flows for the, the one, the two, the 10, 25, and 100 year storms have been matched almost exactly, if not slightly decreased. Um, and we tried to replicate existing drainage areas to those, um, to their, res their respective areas within the wetland um, to put back the same amount of water that's getting there under existing conditions. And we did so by pre preparing a pretty sophisticated uh, drainage plan that has a series of, there's four underground infiltration basins uh, with isolator rows to treat water quality. And there's also four above ground um, infiltration basins, all set a couple feet above the groundwater elevations we receive from our geotechnical engineer. Um, and again, everything uh, is getting to the exact same place as it's going today uh, to each of these locations. So we were able to respect the existing drainage patterns as much as we could. Um, so they're, they're, to, to answer your question, the long and short of it is on the west side of the property and even along the eastern boundary of the wetland lines, the, the impact to that system as a whole will be negligible. And he, he'll see more impacts to his site on the west side of the property. Jeff, uh, Kevin from the commission, um, how will the mitigation area affect that farming area around it? Uh, it's a good question. I mean, Eric, as far as the plantings go, I know in your report, there'll, there'll be a certain area that wouldn't be able to remain as farm area or some of it would have planting in it. Yeah, but, let, me show, uh, let me share my screen and I'll show you. I've got some photos here. Hold on one second. Sounds uh, good. Where do I do and ideally, that? while I have this up before you hit share, Eric, the, this, um, we respected a, a 30 foot wide buffer on this line here just because of the fact there's a residential requirement if that requirement could be waived or we could put this driveway a little bit closer to the property line, we would have no issue even granting more of that field. There's a little bit of a swath here between the buffer that would just kind of be lawn area um, and it would just kind of be bisected by this um, driveway. So if we can, to the extent we can move that to the east closer to the property line, we will, but we will still respect the, uh, the buffers within the zoning regulations. Okay, let me just, show, I'll show you, um I'm just going to show you the photographs of the uh, mitigation area so that you can see it really won't affect the farm. Uh, it, it's really located at the edge of the farm. Um, whether it 
affects a small area of it. I suppose that's possible, but I don't think so. We're only taking 10,000 square feet. And uh, let me just orient you. This is standing in the farm field, looking out at the mitigation area. So just about, I don't know if you can see my cursor or not. Can you see my yeah. cursor? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this, this, these trees and this shrub line, that's about the edge of the wetland. So moving out from there, which is basically this edge area here that's not part of the farm area, that's essentially our mitigation area. It's going to come out like this, carve back around and back into the wood line like that. Uh, from this next photo, if you look here, uh, this is looking from the wetland south back out towards the cornfield. Here's a wetland flag here. If you could just follow my cursor. The mitigation area would go out like this, would cut around these small shrubs here and back like this. Um, and again, here's a side view. Uh, the, the wetland area and the wetland now ends right about here. The mitigation area sort of comes out like this and back and then back around. So it, it's really not going to encroach in the cornfield. If it does, it would be a manner, a manner of feet. Um, so it, it really shouldn't affect um affect the uh the existing limits of of, of farmland farmland thank you thank you and what kind of maintenance plan is required uh, or done for something like this because obviously this doesn't establish itself overnight yeah so what we proposed is um a th uh, um uh, after the initial planting the, se the first season when we do the planting we would propose and and obviously this is you know the town can increase this if they feel like they need to, but we would propose a three-year uh, monitoring. Uh, and during that period, we would, uh, you know, investigate the plantings that were installed, uh, provide um, uh, reports to the town each at the end of each season showing the success of the plantings. If we have issues in terms of plant failure or encroachment from invasives, um, we would uh, make modifications during that three-year period and, again, provide annual reports. And, uh, and that's described in my, um, in my report. So we, we do a three-year monitoring. If the town has a, a standard of practice that's greater than that, we would, we would adhere to that. Thank you. Thank you. And to piggyback on that a bit, I did want to touch on, on erosion control. I, I know we've talked to the client regarding the, the recommendations set forth in Eric's report, and we are amenable to, to providing those for the soil erosion. We do have a pretty robust soil erosion plan as it is with perimeter silt fencing, and I believe I read something um, in the, the conditions and the letter that came out from town staff that there's a particular type of perimeter fencing or perimeter soil erosion measure that you would like to see. We are amenable to doing so. Um, we do have inlet filters at all the catch basins. Um, we do have temporary sediment traps throughout the duration of construction um, that have been sized accordingly. So I think you'll find that the erosion control measures um, are, are pretty robust and they are in accordance with the 2002 soil erosion guidelines. So I just wanted to add that because I know Eric mentioned his, uh, his recommendations before. Mm -hmm. Did anybody else have any questions? Hmm. I don't hear of any. <laughs> did you have any anything else? Or Lauren, did you have anything? Um, uh, Jeff was just referring to the silt sacks. Um, basically, there's they are um, kind of like big nylons. They fill with uh, mulch or something of that nature. They're very effective. Uh, around wetlands because you don't have to actually dig it down to the soils yep. to put the silt, the silt fencing in. Yep. And once they're, you know, what, once you're done with them, you could just slice them open and just decays in place. And yeah, if, nice. there are, if there are any critters, they're able to get over it. So yep. we have a product that we would, we can, we can specify that we've used that's similar to the core fiber logs that you're referring to. So yep. the details for that. There, yeah, there's many of them out there. As long as it's you know that type, I think that'll be great. Um, I've I have done some vernal pool studies in the past, back in the early two uh, two thousands myself, um, and I was always taught that if the they had if the vernal pool had less than twenty five egg masses, that it was probably not very viable. 
Yeah. So, I, I, unfortunately, I hate to agree that this unfortunate, unfortunately, this pool probably will not survive. But I suppose we could always try putting a fence on, along the road or something so they don't migrate that way. But I don't think it's going to be no. very effective. Yeah, it doesn't sound. Oh, so, unfortunate. Um, so is the uh, is the applicant uh, amenable to the third party inspector? For the erosion and sedimentation control, is uh, um, yeah, I don't. That, I, that shouldn't be a problem. And do we have the um, setting aside the nine acres into permanent easement? Is that listed anywhere? I, I don't believe we we signified a line. We can certainly provide you an exhibit of exactly what that looks like. Um, it was just we did we did a rough calculation based on the tree line up to that emergency driveway. And it was about, I want to say it was 8.91 acres. So it's just about nine acres. And we can easily drop that onto a plan um, when, we, when we file. Okay. That'd be good. Did anybody else have anything? Just making some notes. Okay. And Eric, I do like your recommendations <laughs> that you uh, put in here. Okay, good. Yeah. Also, um, you know, uh, I think we'd want to make sure that, uh, you know, certainly in terms of the erosion and sedimentation control, uh, the preservation and protection of any of the existing trees when possible. Yep. yep. It, just to elaborate on that, um, Kevin, um, we did specify that in, in my uh, wetland mitigation area discussion that that is specified. Um, I took a pretty, I took a close look at it out in the field, but um, it wasn't, we didn't exactly stake it out. So, but if you see, I estimated there may be three or so trees that would have to come down, but I actually think we could work around them and incorporate the trees as little islands in the mitigation area. So there's essentially no trees in that area except for a couple, just those few that I, I noted in my report. Yeah. But I'd like to keep them and work around them if we could. If, if they'll survive, because. Uh, right, right, exactly. In my experience, they don't long term. Yeah, yeah. But if they did, if, if you did lose them and they became snags, that's not bad in terms of a wetland. If it's your yard, that's bad. But if it's a mitigation right. area, that's yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, would the applicant be utilizing? I guess this is for Jeff. Um, you know, Eric did a really detailed, uh, an awesome wetland creation construction sequence. Would you be using that? Yes, we will be taking guidance from Eric's report, and we have professional landscape architects that will put together a, a formal mitigation plan um, utilizing Eric's comments that he received. Okay. That we okay, that's good. Just one other thing, Kevin, to add to that. We, we will need to do uh, to set to to determine the exact bottom elevation of the mitigation area. We're we're going to have to go out and do test pits, so that we would do before we would um, do obviously do the grading and planting. So we would do test pits just to get soil profiles and figure out the depth of seasonal high groundwater. Okay. So maybe as um, one of the um, things that we would want to see that detailed plan. You know, you have yours, but I would like to see one from the applicant on what they plan to do. Yeah, I think what we could do is take my sequence in my report. We can put it on a plan that shows a blow up of the mitigation area with exactly what needs to be done. And then you could, you know, that could become, you know, the required sequence. Yep. Yeah, that sounds good. Donna? Yeah. Um, no, I just, I just wanted to just say a couple words. Um, 
I think a lot of thoughts gone into this project um, and from looking at it, you know, I mean, they are, I like the consideration of leaving the nine acres to consider, continue agricultural. Um, and as he said before that, if we could find a way to do a variance and move that driveway, they could actually give that a little bit more space for agricultural. So, um, you know, I, I think the applicant is, is really doing a good job in, in trying to maintain the integrity of the property. Um, so, I mean, I, that's, I agree. that's my yeah. impression of it. Um, again, I'm not an expert like some of you guys on this panel, <laughs> but I'm learning slowly. Um, but, but I think they, they've gone it, and I, I do like the idea of leaving that nine acres. Um, yeah. And I think, I, I think I thank them for that. So that's it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Did anybody else, any others? Yeah. Um, hey, um, so question. So I see the, you're, for the emergency um, dr driveway, I guess, yep. you're using waffle paver stones, which is great. Why, why would you not use that for the access to uh, middle road? Just too long? Yeah, it's, it's just a long run. So we had just done the gravel. Um, it would be amenable to either, but it, it works. They work both in the same. We'd have to look at the loading of, the, of that um, waffle for that length. Um, yeah, there's something we could take a look at. Okay. Any other comments or questions for anybody? Um, Lori, what kind of bonding do we usually do for like when we do a uh, mitigation construction kind of um, like this? Do what kind of bonding is required from the town, or is um, that something we have to specify? We probably decided into the erosion and sedimentation control bond. Okay, I don't think we've uh, specified separate bonds for mitigation. Okay. Okay. Mm. Sounds good. So are the agents ready to continue or? Uh, I am. Okay, before we do any voting, um, I'd like to see Robert Hendrickson. I see he joined our meeting. He joined our meeting just as we started. So we could seat Robert. Is he still here? Okay. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. I, I know you joined just as we were, you know, doing the, just after the roll call stuff. <laughs> I had some troubles. <laughs> okay, that's good. <laughs> We're getting used to this. <laughs> so, right. do we have any? Do you, do you want a motion? Any motions? Yes, please. Yeah, all right. I will make a motion um, that we approve IW number 605. Um, permit for construction of a 29,000 square foot assisted living facility and associated improvements uh, within and adjacent to wetlands at 118 Hazard Avenue, map 65, lot 59 in the BPR44 zones uh, with our standard conditions and the following um, site specific conditions. Um, that there will be a mitigation construction sequence plan um, uh, presented um, to us um, that a third party inspector will be um, hired to monitor the sediment con uh, sedimentation control, um, that um, we will uh, receive a plan that um, delineates the mitigation area specifically um, at a minimum of two to one, like you said, um, that we have uh, appropriate documentation of the um, uh, nine acres of agricultural conservation and um, just specifically that the 
um, maximum preservation and protection of any existing trees uh, will be done appropriately. Um, did I did I miss anything? I think it did good. I'll second. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, all the maintenance, we have all the maintenance plans in that in there. Yeah, yes, and, and maintenance plans um, as well yeah. for the mitigation areas. I guess that'd be a sixth one. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Do we have any more discussion? I'll second. Thank you. Do we have any more discussion? Seeing none, can we do roll call, please, Jenny? Did we lose Jenny? Jenny, got to unmute. Hello. She's muted. Oh, oh there she goes. You have to unmute me. <laughs> Am I muted? You're okay, Jenny. You're good now. Okay. <laughs> Donna? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Virginia? Yes. Carrie? Oh, Carrie Ann, no. Uh, <laughs> Marie? Yes. Marcy? Marcy. Hello. She's, de she's deleted. Oh. Oh. Hello? Yes. Is Marcy there? Yeah, she just said yes. Okay, then that's it. Uh, Bob, Bob Hendrickson. Oh, he, yes. did you see him? He's an alternate. Yeah, I seated him, yeah. Okay, uh, Robert? Yes. Okay. okay, so count right, that's six in favor, motion passes. <laughs> 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 so thank you, gentlemen, it was a very good presentation. I appreciate yeah. how you uh, went about, you know, saving our wetlands and taking everything into consideration and the farmland and the vertical pools, everything. So you did a great job. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, and I want, I want, especially want to thank Eric because you know a lot of times we get uh, wetland scientists in here, and they, you know, it's it's a little too heavy on the side of the client where there's not really good recommendations. It's like, yeah, it's good, it's good. So <laughs> I, I really, I really appreciate appreciate that. Uh, I understood. Yeah. I am sorry. You could get back on that. As a fellow wetland commissioner, okay. I understand. I've, I've, I've been there myself. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye, right, guys. Thank you. Yeah, give everybody a minute. Okay, so next on the agenda <coughs> is IW 607 113 North Maple Street. Application uh, for, oh, application for a PIM permit to conduct a regulated activity in the 100 foot upland review area to construct a proposed distribution facility and associated improvement uh, property known as Robert, I'm on the computer. Don't do that. <laughs> Everybody please mute. <laughs> Except me maybe. <laughs> it's the FedEx man, sorry. I'll go shut the door. Up. Okay, so I think we're good on the a minute here. Can uh, Donna, just before we continue, can I just just make one mention to Savannah, well, uh, Savannah Nicole, sorry, um, that it, uh, one thing that we often get that's very helpful, especially now going through this is we'll get a proposed um, draft resolution. Um, so it just it's easier to kind of write that out and put the notes on that. So we get the wording right. and We don't leave out anything. Um, we've gotten those, we get those in the past and they're very helpful. Sure. I yeah. added it on the DPN um, 522-2021. Okay. I didn't see it. So um, there was a lot of stuff. So. Sure. No, <laughs> totally understandable. I have to take full responsibility. I wrote the two memos for these two applications and I totally forgot to put the motion in. No worries. So no worries. I we can I make it work. Did. Been a while. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. Continue. Yeah. So, uh, is our applicants here for 113 North Maple? We are. There you are. Hi. You how are you? Nice, nice to see you, folks. 
Um, I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. Name and address. Yes, this is, yes, this is Valerie Farrow from Good Earth Advisors representing the applicant. Okay. I'm a certified planner and a uh, environmental scientist. With me is uh, Jim Petropoulos, who is the president of Hainer Swanson, and Jim is our professional engineer. And then we also have Scott Egan, who is our wetland ecologist, who has been working with us on, on the critter side, technically, um, from, from AECOM. So how we're going to do this is I'm going to give you an overview um, of the property, uh, take you through a high level of the site development, and then we'll bring Scotty in to discuss more of the details of the wetlands and the things that certainly you, you folks are the most interested in. And okay. then close with Jim's, um, Jim's uh, approach to stormwater and erosion. I'm, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, did you say? Oh, that's okay. Yeah, sorry, I started to interrupt. Um, Lauren, did we get ca uh, call up Carrie Ann and get her back in? Sorry, we're missing one of our... <laughs> I, I yes. did. Oh, yes. perfect. Yeah, she was on the phone, I saw her, yeah. Yeah, so we have, do we have everyone? Did she sign back in? Yeah. Yes. I'm right. Good. Perfect. Everybody see me okay. now? Perfect. Perfect. There she is. Okay. Oh, there she is. Hello. Perfect. Sorry to interrupt you. I wanted to make no, sure. No, that's okay. Her. That's fine. That's <laughs> fine. Um, it's kind of hard. <laughs> so th this application is uh, involving 113 North Maple. Uh, the applicant is, um, it's an LLC, a subsidiary of Win Stanley Enterprises. As, as you know, um, Win Stanley's have done a number of uh, uh, developments in town. Uh, this proposal involves a 501,500 square foot building um, at the corner of Moody and North Maple. And uh, interesting property um, because this actually was the subject of a planning zoning approval in 1990 mm -hmm. for 11 to 12 industrial lots. So the entire parcel would have been, well, it was approved, um, divvied up into smaller footprints for ind industrial properties. Um, as you know, only one really was built and that was 10 Lego Way at the time it was Lego. Um, and from then it just remained fallow. Um, changed hands back and forth, uh, nothing really happened. Now, interestingly, um, Lego, 10 Lego Way was constructed uh, 10 years later. So 1990 was the industrial subdivision, 2000 was Lego Way. Um, and then a few years later, they resubdivided and you know some of the lot lines were moved around. Um, so it's always been industrial zone and the intent has always been industrial, um, but for whatever reason, it just never manifested a completely full industrial park. Um, and when you look at the property, um, I think that's probably a good thing now. And what we've been trying to do for the last two years is strike a balance between the, you know, the market demand, clearly, um, economic feasibility, but really the physical characteristics of the site. And so in 2017, when um, Adam Woodsdale and, and his family took over the property, we actually consolidated four property, or we, we started looking at four properties after starting to look at two initial properties. And we realized that, you know, we just couldn't shoehorn development into the property the way it was. Uh, so what we have before you, we think is a really good uh, plan it strikes that balance. Um, and guess what? It took us two years, but we're avoiding any direct wetland impacts. Uh, our, early, our early ideas really were reaching well into the back property line. Uh, there were wetland impacts. There were some you know, other issues there. So um, we're, we're happy that we not only have a tenant and we have something to share with the town, but we're also doing it, I think, environmentally sensitive. So Jim, why don't you bring up that aerial just for context, just in case you folks don't know that uh, that corner of uh, North Maple and Moody Road. Can you bring that up, Jim? You'll have to share the screen. Yep, the little envelope there. There we go. Okay. Perfect. So there you have the site. Um, and this is now a compilation of four properties. And yeah, Jim, let's just start at 12 o'clock and go around. Um, so we've got a couple residences right over on the other side of, of uh, Moody. Yep, 
And then interestingly, we have an industrial property right at the corner as you move west. And there are some residences right next to that industrial property. Um, and then of course we have Lego, 10 Lego way in the back, which I'm not sure if it's still being occupied by 3M, but um, 3M had been occupying that. We have the public works co uh, complex right above there, a little bit off, off site. As you folks know, we've got the uh, Enfield uh, Senior Center and the police department. Mm -hmm. um, then on the other side, the east side, um, we have, of course, what we call now the annex, the old Fermi High School that's been closed. Uh, more multifamily development and residential rings the rest of the, um, the site. Um, I will note that the houses to the south there uh, were built after um, the industrial subdivision and um, you know, during the Lego, the Lego period when they were looking to develop that site. And um, I, I think that's why you'll see in the rear of the properties a very um, a consistent vegetative buffer for each one of those folks along the south side there, Jim. The red, the yellow line is right on the vegetation line of that, of that southern property. So, um, we, we have allowed it to continue to be farmed. Um, and um, what we hope we can do is show you how we will um, lay out the, the uh, 500, 500 plus thousand square foot building in relation to the wetlands. So we thought we would start with this first uh, sketch from Jim. And you will see that there are three wetland systems on the site. Um, there is up in the upper north corner that, and by the way, we had Mark Friend, whose bless his heart, has been involved in this site for since he was a kid, I think. Um, we had him verify the wetlands because he'd done it so many times prior. Um, so that upper area is what we're calling water course one, because Mark didn't feel like it technically met your definition for a wetland. So we have water course one to the north, and then we have two wetland systems that are really uh, used to be one wetland system. And um, it has been truncated by basically a farm road. And note how uh, the wetland juts out towards the central portion of the site. And this has been, you know, our biggest challenge um, because of its orientation and the way it juts in, um, we really could not accommodate a larger building. Um, and, you know, as much as we tried to even avoid the upland review area, given that orientation in relation to the longitudinal layout of the building, it was just, it was a challenge that we really couldn't overcome. Uh, just quickly, the building will be uh, one story. We have it laid out for two tenants. One, as you can see right on there, is Agrimark, the, the dairy company. Great tenants, um, food grade uh, distribution, uh, lo low intensity, um, operating 5 a.m. to 5 p.m., um, and um, we're very happy to have them as a tenant. They actually have a sustainability coordinator. They're very interested in how we're respecting the natural features and um, just, just a really good tenant to have. Um, what you see before you is really the culmination of what I alluded to earlier in this long give and take process of siting a building. Um, we had potential tenants uh, that approached us in the 750,000 to 1 million square foot um, size that, that we could have signed. We just could not. Um, it, it just did not fit. Um, so what you see here is, you know, a, a something that we thought would fit. Uh, we could provide some expansion, again, uh, by respecting that whole western portion um, between what is proposed now. There you go. And... Um, uh, and, and 10 leg away. Um, note, Jim, if you go back to that, note um, the 
that area right there. So after Mark Friend delineated the wetlands, um, I consulted the Natural Diversity Database and we got hits. Um, we didn't know anything at, at the time except for it could be beetles and it could be the eastern box turtle, which of course everyone has. So um, we went looking for them. Um, we did some additional field investigations, which Scott Egan is is on, on here with us and he'll talk about in a minute. Um, but we, and of course we expect, because we're gonna be filing a, a stormwater permit, um, we expect to be continuing to work with DEP on, on that. But the twist here, as Lori knows, is we wanted the team to go back out a few weeks ago, just to take a look around and get prepared for that stormwater permit. Um, we're also bringing in Dr. Uh, David Wagner, who is a renowned expert on beetles. So we're getting ready to you know, bring him out to the site. Lo and behold, the wetland number two looks a lot like a vernal pool. Hmm. And we're not gonna refute it. We're not gonna pretend it's not there. We're not gonna say it's low value. We're gonna say, you know, it, it could be a vernal pool. So let's make sure it's protected. Uh, let's keep an eye on it and move forward. Um, but it's heightened our sense of protection, certainly. And this has all emerged in just the last few weeks. Um, we don't know how many egg masses there will be, but certainly we will be, uh, certainly be working with and as we continue through this, we'll do what we need to do to protect. Um, we, uh, let me talk, yeah, start at the north. Let me talk a little bit about Agrimark, uh, just in case you have interest in this, that they're gonna be using the Moody Road entrance and exit. They're gonna come in from Moody Road. They're gonna drop their trailer. Um, if you can move their cursor, there you go, Jim, right in there. Uh, they're gonna drop their trailer. They're gonna pick up an empty one and go back up to Springfield. They also have trucks that possibly come up. Um, they do work with uh, uh, Cabot and that family owned dairy up in Vermont. So um, that's really the in and the out. Tenant B, we don't know who it'll be, um, but uh, we, we are talking to, again, food grade type distribution folks. Uh, Agrimark has very little demand for parking. So we have provided some parking as they wanted. And then we've also provided um, uh, more, it's about 169 spaces for tenant B. Uh, what we're going to do when we get in front of planning and zoning is that um, the parking ratios under the current uh, zoning regs would have had us put 400 parking spots, 401 to be exact, 401 parking spots. And we're going in with a lot less. <laughs> so we, we just do not see the need to over park. Uh, we don't see the need for more pavement. And certainly we don't see the need to be generating any more stormwater. So um, that's given us a little bit of breathing room um, to work to work through the site. Um, let me, and I think, are there any questions thus far? I wanna stop, because I know. Yeah, I, I actually do have a question. I, my, um, so was, is there any consideration if, if this uh, wetland area um, is potentially a vernal pool, and mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously we'll see that. Is there any consideration of maybe moving that parking area that's there, maybe expanding the um, northern parking area and moving the stormwater management to the uh, west? Not. Yeah, I, boy, if we could have, we would have done that before we even knew it was a vernal pool. That parking is actually loading and circulation. So without that, the lower part of the building could not be used. Hmm. Hmm. And you will know, there be any, you know, will there be a truck wash station? No. Okay. Oh no, this is just distribution. No fueling. Okay. No, I mean, pretty minimal, pretty minimal impact. Other questions? Jim, do you want to add any more on the engineering side or should we bring in Scott? Um, yeah, I'll talk briefly, Val. Why don't I go through just some of the layout stuff 
uh, and also I'll talk storm water and then we'll we'll wrap up with uh, with Scott. Thank you. My name is Jim Petropoulos. I'm a civil engineer with Hainer Swanson. I'm up here in Nashua, New Hampshire tonight, so thank you for saving me some some mileage. <laughs> Um, what I'm going to try to do is just present to you um, a little bit of the thinking that went into the stormwater. Obviously, we've got a big, uh, a big project, 71 acres in size. But really, the project, if you look at the relationship of the building, which is a half a million square feet to our paving, um, there is a lot of open land left up to the north. There's open land along the buffer, which we try to respect along uh, North Maple Street. Uh, we are, because we're a farm field here to our resident neighbors to the south, we're trying to construct a nice landscape berm here to the south. And really, we're trying to also protect, as Val said, this 15 plus acres in the back of the property near wetland number two that, that, uh, that runs off to, uh, to the southwest. Um, with regard to stormwater, what we typically do as a designer is we try to address quality and quantity to make sure there's no downstream adverse impacts. And where this water is running is the majority is running through this complex to the southwest. And there's also a small swale located here that eventually connects into uh, water course number one up near Lego Way. Uh, we're going to employ a combination of curbing and catch basins through our parking and loading areas. Um, as well as opening grass swales. So it's a, a combination of treatment practices. Uh, the site itself, we're very fortunate, is mostly sandy soils. In the northern part of the site, we have deep deposits to, uh, to groundwater, high groundwater levels, or the groundwater levels are very low. The south part of the site, they're actually a little bit, uh, a little bit higher. Um, so what we did is essentially broke the site into half, where the top half, the northerly half, uh, would contain a number of drainage treatment elements and then ultimately discharge into this stormwater area. Uh, let me walk you through those. The front part of the Agrimark roof, because roof is generally considered a cleaner stormwater discharge, is we're running a recharge trench right along the face of the building here to promote recharge, take advantage of those sandy soils. Um, this small parking and access drive We'll, we'll discharge into a uh, rain garden area, a bioretention cell, where uh, again, we rely on, on, uh, on recharge to accommodate our stormwater from that small parking lot. Uh, from there, runoff will be piped behind the building. The loading and trailer parking behind the building will go into stormwater practice area A. Uh, and that is intended to be an infiltration basin. Um, it's a large basin, about two acres in size. It will be a dry basin. Uh, and it's really designed to provide storage and recharge for the northerly half of the site. And all of our stormwater is being designed for a small building addition to the north, as well as a building addition to the south. Um, this stormwater practice here completely stores the 100 year storm event. Um, on the south side of the site, we've got a slightly larger parking area in the front, but again, we want to take advantage of the favorable soils over here. So the front part of tenant roof B is in a recharge trench here, and this parking lot is being discharged into a swale and a recharge trench all along this part of the site. We'll eventually pipe it to stormwater management area A, uh, B, I'm sorry. And in stormwater area B, we'll have a combination of open water and marsh areas um, uh, and an outlet control structure to, to uh, better handle the peak rates of runoff into that larger basin. These types of practices, this wet pond type system, we think provides great qualitative treatment. Um, it allows for the settling of solids. Uh, there's certain biological uptake in some of the plant materials that we'll use here uh, in the basin. Um, the plants will provide slope stabilization as well as aesthetics and some habitat. Um, and then the disturbed areas around both basins will be seeded with a, a meadow mix, which should give it a naturalized look when it's complete. Um, I would like to mention, uh, Madam Chair, that there's actually three discharges, pipe discharges from North Maple Street into the project. Uh, North Maple Street is a state road. 
And many years ago, catch basins were built and they just dumped the water onto this property. We're actually gathering and collecting that stormwater, bringing it into our system and giving it some qualitative treatment where none currently exists. <coughs> uh, real quick, with regard to erosion control, obviously we want to protect the resource areas here. We want to protect our butters and the perimeter of the property. Um, silt socks will be used throughout the project, especially in the vicinity of wetland number one here. Um, construction exits uh, out to the streets in three locations. We use temporary sediment basins and diversion swales throughout the project, silt sacks at all the catch basins, and of course, dust control throughout the project. Um, and then permanent measures really are just best management practices. They're sweeping parking lots. They're paying attention to the buildup in the sediment four bays in these stormwater areas. Um, and it's, it's just good common sense once, uh, once the site is operating. So in summary, Madam Chair, with regard to stormwater, we've tried to use a combination of treatment practices, some LIDs, uh, and then some practices that handle the bigger storms. Um, especially for the rooftop and that back, uh, back loading and trailer parking area. We wanted to take advantage of the sandy soils. We're promoting recharge through the site. And, uh, and due to the size of these basins, you know, again, they measure about two acres each. Uh, we're actually able to control our peak rates of runoff such that they're even less than what's getting off there now. So that's kind of the overview on, on stormwater. I'll be happy to answer any questions on stormwater at this time. Uh, I don't have anything at this time. Okay. okay. So let's um let's talk about the good stuff now, which is the <laughs> wetlands. <laughs> We're going to bring uh, Scott Egan on again. Scott is our uh, wetland ecologist with AECOM, and um, they have been retained to uh, analyze, investigate, and guide us. Um, through the permitting process with regard to uh, endangered species, uh, natural resources, um, and the like. Um, Scott actually uh, worked you know, as part of a team in the original, uh, the, the original examination of the site. Um, he's in the process right now of uh, pulling together some documentation for the Connecticut DEP and uh, certainly will be staying involved um, with regards to really anything um, regarding the ecology of the site. Uh, Scott, you're, you're with us, correct? Yeah, there yes, you are. Yes, I'm still here. <laughs> Taking it all in. Uh, yep. So Scott, uh, Jim, just so we don't have to keep going back and forth with who controls things, let's start with this. And then Jim has a number of things that if you wanna just you know ask him to load up, they might not be in all the order, but we can we can talk through them. That's all right. Um, as Val said, my name is Scott Egan. I work for AECOM as a wetland and wildlife ecologist. Um, <clears throat> my background is primarily in vernal pools, amphibians, and reptiles. Uh, I've been working for, with box turtles and vernal pools for over 20 years. Uh, my master's degree uh, research was in vernal pools and actually um, some of the, the uh, guidance that came out of the best management practices uh, that was discussed by Bowler previously uh, came out of my research uh, that I conducted down at University of Rhode Island, uh, which was a landscape scale ecology study on vernal pools and um, looking at uh, impacts of development on amphibian, on wood frogs and spotted salamanders. Um, so my, I became involved in this project in 2017. Um, at that time, we had submitted an information request to the NDDB, and that's when we found out about the, um, the eastern box turtle and the, and the beetles. So we went out there to um, do a habitat evaluation of the whole property, uh, look at the wetlands, uh, assess the functions and values of the wetlands and look at um, the, the plant communities and plant structures that, that were on site in re relation to the listed species that we got back from NDDB. 
Um, at that time, back in 2017, looking at Wetland 2, I was there in February and early March, which is typically a time you would see a vernal pool, you know, nicely and nice and deeply flooded. And that at that time, there was no water in that pool at all. And so my thought was, and, and I don't recall. I don't have the data offhand, but I, I don't recall that it was a an off year. Like a, it wasn't a drought year as far as I can recall. So it was um so it was to me when I first looked at it, it didn't seem like it would probably I wasn't too concerned about it being a vernal pool. Um and then I think Val had been on that site as well in 2019 in the spring and it was dry then as well. So when uh, Dennis Lowry, also from Acom, went back out there just to get a little uh, review on the site this spring, uh, we were kind of surprised to see some water in there and some wood frog tadpoles. So, um, but all that aside, the, the the design has always been to avoid these wetland impacts. And from um, so this this wetland here is uh, it's only about. 0.36 acres in size, the wetland two. It is isolated, um, and it is. It was probably a part of wetland one, which is to the west, and it's separated by approximately 20 foot wide access road um, to the south of the the yellow square or where the hand is. There used to be a uh, big barn there, and I think that that's what that uh, access road was accessed down to that barn. And there's no pipe between the two wetlands that I could find when I was out there. I, it was pretty thick brush, but I scoured, scoured around and through there and did not see any kind of connection. Um, I had, when I had got back to the office, I went back and looked at all the aerial, uh, well, a number of years back worth of aerial photographs all the way back to the, um, 1934 aerial photographs. Yeah, see, there's, there's the road. Um, the, that, so that road has been there since 1934 and you can kind of, that, that's, Arrow doesn't have the property boundaries on it, but you can see where wetland two is in that square right there. Yeah. And then the road that goes between the two and you can see the wetland system. That's a long linear wetland system. Number two, that runs along the, the Southern edge of that field there. Yeah. That whole area in there. Um, let's see, uh, yeah, so the, the, that wetland too probably gets most of its hydrology. Um, there's some, probably some surface runoff that comes from the north, northeast off the fields. Um, and then probably some hydrologic input from groundwater as well. I, I, I know Jim probably knows a little bit more about how deep the groundwater table is there, but there, I suppose there could be some groundwater influence in there as well. Um, once you get to the side of that road into the wetland one, it, it, it's kind of a, a deeper area and it's, um, it's narrow. It doesn't pond water for any length of time. There is a little intermittent stream in that wetland that flows to the west. Um, goes through a couple small, smaller ponds way off the site and eventually flows into a um, uh, freshwater brook. Hmm. Uh, it's like 3,400 linear feet or so down gradient from there. Uh, let's see. The, as far as box turtle habitat goes, uh, box turtles typically um, use forested uplands edge habitats and they prefer scrub shrub and um, open area, open sandy gravelly areas for nesting. Uh, the, they will cross fields, agricultural fields. They don't typically hang out with them in them unless it's a, a really dense vegetation cover, real de like a, maybe a, like hay fields that aren't maybe mowed every year that are really deep and have a deep thatch layer. They'll hang out in those types of habitats, but open fields, there it's not typically where they would hang out. Um, and as discussed before, when Bowler was talking about their their situation there, you know, the amphibians, the wood frogs and spotted salamanders and other vernal pool obligate species, 
typically use, they spend the majority of their life cycle in forested upland habitats and migrate to the pools in the early spring for a very brief time to deposit their eggs. Um, what the significance of those buffer zones, that zero to 100 and the 100 to 750 foot zones, which they refer to as the vernal pool envelope and the critical, critical terrestrial habitat. There you go. Um, the, the vernal pool envelope is significant because it's a, it's a concentrated area around the pool where immigrating um, amphibians can occur in high densities during the breeding period. And it's also important for emigration of the metamorphs when the, when the, when the tadpoles and salamander larvae metamorphosize, they'll oftentimes leave the pool into forested upland areas and um, spend their first winter in that area before migrating further distances out into the landscape. Um, and then that 100, 750 foot zone is kind of an area where you, you could expect like adult wood frogs and spotted salamanders to migrate into is when it's forested upland habitats. The agricultural fields really don't provide any kind of habitat for them. And um, if I don't know, Jim, if you've got the aerial with the with the uh, close up aerial with the development um, overlay on it, but the that you had uh, one of the um, members had asked about the parking. Yeah, about the parking along that edge there. And from the first map we were looking at, when you asked that question, you couldn't see it because it didn't have the aerial on it. But that, all of that uh, parking area is in the existing open field. So it's, it provides, um, so it's at this particular time, it's not providing actual um, habitat for wood frogs and spotted salamanders for the metamorphs or the um, adults. And because everything to the east of there is open field, and then you have a road to the east, uh, you know, we have uh, uh, Maple Street paralleling that, it's very likely that any and all amphibians that might use this potential pool are coming from the, from the forested areas to the west. Um, that's a that that field and road is a is a pretty good barrier to um, movement from any kind of habitats to the east. And actually, the it's even much further distance to the next forest patch to the east off of uh, Maple Street is is pretty far away as well. So I think it's quite likely. So this this picture is the this is the picture that Dennis took this spring. Um, you can see. In that picture, that the uh, the water it is ponded, but it's it's not ponded very deeply. And since we've had a couple years, that's the picture that I took in 2017 in the spring. Uh, that with the dry basin, so you can kind of get an idea of how how much water this thing holds. It, it this area, if you stay on this picture here, Jim, kind of about where your hand is where the hand is, is where the majority of that ponding occurs, maybe out to where that tire is, um, and then back back towards the bottom of the screen. Um, that's the area that is flooded in, uh, in, in um, the spring of 2020 picture, the May 2020 picture. And also, if you look at the trees in the foreground, you can kind of see the water marks on those trees. So it probably ponds with maybe a foot of water or so, and with the sandy gravelly soils that are underlaying this, it's all uh, glacial fluvial soils. The, my guess is that this pond does not hold water for very long. Um, so it's hard to say without, you know, looking at it year after year, but based on the fact that we've got two years of observations with no water and then one year of shallow water and the evidence of uh, flooding is maybe a foot or so deep, there's a pretty good chance that this pool does not, at least does not function as a, a significant source of recruitment to the population, to the amphibian population there um, for any length, uh, for every year anyways. Um, it could potentially in some years, if you have really wet years, you could probably get some successful recruitment out of there, but um, 
in 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 some in most years, at least based on what we've seen so far, maybe not. Um, as far as the Beatles, though. No, go, go ahead. Yeah, touch on the Beatles because it's an interesting. Okay. Um, the so David Wagner is is the person we've gotten to. Um, take a look at the habitat as far as the beetles are concerned. And one of the reasons why, I mean, there's a number of reasons why you would choose David Wagner, uh, aside from the fact that he's very well known um, as an entomologist in Connecticut and really throughout the world. He travels constantly um, doing research on, on beetles and moths and things like that. But he also worked on this very site in 2003 and had done work with the Beatles on this site. Now the report that they put together had, um, so, so the, the Beatles, I don't, I don't know too much, I'm not an expert on, on sand tiger beetles, but they do, I do know they prefer um, very sparsely de uh, vegetated, sandy dune type habitat and there were areas that were enhanced back at the time when Lego was built that for that species, but they no longer, um, but it is now where that hand is shown, that's, that's where that area was. And it has now been fully overgrown. So, I mean, we'll have to wait to see what um, Dr. Wagner's uh, interpretation of it is, because um, he went out there, I believe, last weekend. Correct. So, well, hopefully you'll we'll have some more information on that soon, but at least for now, the, it would appear that the, the habitat that was there for that species is no longer there um, without doing some vegetation management or something to that effect. So we'll see what he says. Um, the agricultural lands do not really provide habitat for that species. It's, uh, like I said, it's primarily open, sandy dune habitat. Um, I think that pretty much covers everything from the wildlife species. We are gonna be um, resubmitting uh, all this information to the NDDB and doing a safe harbor um, request. So we'll, we'll be working with the NDDB on, on these species and protection of them um, I think in general for the, for the, for the development period, the best alternative for protecting these species is to have a, a silt fence barrier installed along the limits of work along that western side of the project between the limits of work and those forested habitats. And if we do that, because that will really protect any animals from being injured during construction of the project. And, um, and, and I know, uh, Laura, you had mentioned about um, silt socks in, in this project and the other project, but um, because the, and, and my recommendation would be to just stick with the silt fence because that's a really firm barrier to box turtles. So if there are box turtles using those habitats west of the project, you would want to keep them out of there and the silt fence will do that. And because I believe that any amphibians that are using that pool would also be coming from the from areas to the west, that that would also keep them from going into the development area and it won't impede them from getting into the vernal pool um, if, the, if the appropriate conditions are there for them in, 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 you know, in future years. Um, so, uh, the, the other thing I wanted to add is that um, we're going to be, uh, we would train and basically provide a, a, a tutorial with the on-site crews during construction uh, prior to and continuing construction so that they actually can recognize the turtles. Um, we've done this a number of places on Wind Stanley properties. It's worked out quite well. Uh, the crews are always very interested in looking out for them. And, you know, if that is the case, we move them out of harm's way. Um, you know, we process some paperwork if it turns out to be a, a box turtle. So there's a number of things that we can do. Um, but, but 
again, to drive home the point, you know, we've, we've cited the building, we've tried to, we have avoided, you know, direct impacts to, to the wetlands. Um, you know, any short-term impacts that we're going to possibly create would be mitigated through erosion sedimentation control and best management practices, as Jim had, uh, had alluded to. Um, and, you know, uh, lo long-term, if we could keep that, that system, that green belt system uh, to the rear, I think it would protect the wetlands. Um, it would continue to function as wetlands always do. I mean, what's, a, what's one of the primary functions of wetlands besides habitat is, is you know, water quality. Um, and I think if we can keep that intact, um, we will certainly have achieved our intended objective. And, you know, one last comment is that 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 area that, you know, we're not sure if it's a vertical pool, but we want to respect it as one. Um, as you noticed, even in the 1934 aerials, that has been there and it's been sustained through some incredibly invasive agricultural practices and who knows what else. And it's still there. Um, it hasn't gotten any bigger, um, hasn't gotten any smaller. Um, to me, that suggests it's probably more, you know, groundwater infiltration. Um, but, um, you know, again, certainly worth uh, respecting. Uh, Jim, do you have other things to add? Um, yes, Val, just real quick, I call your attention to this drawing. There are two impact areas. Um, this particular impact is to construct a, uh, some tree clearing and get us into that lower wetland Scott talked about with an outlet pipe from stormwater management area B. We like to control our discharges. We do not like to dump water through the woods because it can create erosion over time. So we're going to build a, a 12 inch pipe with a small end wall here. Minimal clearing, 15 feet wide. We're not touching the wetland. That's buffer, that's regulated impact area A. And then regulated impact area B here is for the trailer parking for tenant B. Uh, it's approximately 7,000 square feet. And as Scott has alluded to, it is uh, within the farm field. We're not touching any woods here for this. And uh, erosion control will be measured right, it will be installed right up along that line there. So I just wanted to describe uh, to the IWWA, those, for those two yellow areas is really why we're here uh, tonight before you. Questions from the commission? Sorry, I do have a question. Um, so across the street where what used to be Fermi, um, I do know uh, historically there was some contamination issues at Fermi, uh, my understanding that uh, the fields were capped because of contamination. Um, what is the likelihood? Have you done any testing to see if this might go over to the, the farmland um, on this site? And if so, what kind of impact could this have as you're doing the construction here to these um, wetland areas? Uh, Wynn Stanley's standard corporate procedures is to do phase ones and actually phase twos. Um, so this site has been investigated and uh, nothing was discovered, no, nothing regulated under RSRs. Um, and so we have, uh, we have not seen any evidence of migration from the Fermi site or vice versa. Um, and um, again, this is part of a standard procedure that's put in place by Win Stanley's corporate practices. Um, so we were quite uh, um, assured very early on, um, frankly, before he purchased it, um, to understand the environmental conditions of the site. Okay. Okay. Good question, Kevin. I don't see any um, where you, for snow piles when you do the driveways, especially for tenant B. Where, where would you do the? I think the question is snow removal. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So the front snow stock piling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Front field will likely cast off along this edge here, and that's the edge where we have 
um, our stormwater infiltration trench. So we, we think it's a pretty good location, uh, you know, as the snow melts to be able to get into the practice and work its way into stormwater B. Um, this access road here um, will cast off along the grass treatment swale and then ultimately into B. And then in this location, we are curbed. And we left this area blank thinking they would plow along the curb line back into this particular location, which is the sediment four bay, which is a, a plunge pool. It's exactly where we want to put it. Let the large particulate to kind of settle out and uh, before it ends into the practice and ultimate discharge. So um, we, we think we've got a good, a good program with, with snow removal. Uh, same thing on the other end, this large area of, of, of asphalt will end up back into the, the storage recharge basin here. And of course, we've got a small driveway here uh, with plenty of room for snow storage. So uh, we've got good room and everything ends up getting treated. Thank you. Is there any other questions from the commission agents? Uh, not for me. Mm. I have a question. Sure. Madam Chair. It's Lori yeah. Witten. Yes, Lori. Uh, Val, did you um, look at the photometric plan at all? Yes. Seeing, uh, seeing there would be lighting uh, adjacent yes. to the vernal pool. I don't know if you saw that. I sent it earlier to you. Um, I said I blow up. Jim, do, do you happen to have that? Um, I, I don't have the... Um, the, the question that Ms. Witten is asking has to do with these light poles. Right, yes. right. So, and, and I'll give you the, 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 the story here. So when we submitted the first photometrics, you know, the file was marked photometrics. We sent them in with the plans. When we opened them up, in fact, Lori and I looked at them together, we noticed that they didn't take them all the way out. So it only showed illumination right at the very edge of pavement. So we sent our um, our lighting consultant back to the drawing board and told them to rerun the model but carry it out um and Lori, what i sent um you folks uh, probably around 11 o'clock this morning was an overall a photometrics plan and and then a blow up that jim did um to show that the uh foot candles drop off dramatically um they're probably in and then, by the way, they accounted for the woods. Uh, by the time they arrived at that uh, potential vernal pool, I think it was uh, 0.1, 0.2, Jim? It was between 0.5 foot candles at the, the closest location, Val. But I would say along this edge, it would, uh, it would likely average around 0 0.2, 0 0.25 foot candle okay. level. Okay. Uh, and, and then continues uh, very dramatically, falls off to zero just... Just be just beyond there. And that did not include any shields we could install along the backs of these light poles, Val. Right. Yeah, that was just a sta that was a standard um, full cutoff, of course, dark sky compliant fixture. Um, but I wanted him to run it um, just to see what it would look like without any kind of um, a retrofit. Um, Lori, we did ask them to look into a flange. Uh, just in case. So if we want to retrofit those those LED uh, full cutoffs with a flange to, to uh, um, I, I just wasn't sure, you know, how we can arrange that because we want the light to go off slightly off the edge of pavement so that um, a, a truck or a vehicle could clear or, or a pedestrian for that matter could clearly determine that edge of pavement. Um, but I'm sure we could work something out. Thank you. Yes, but the end of the story is they're no longer five and six foot candles like we thought. <laughs> that's that's good. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Thank you for that. Sure. Other questions? Mm. I don't hear any. Um, again, thank you for the presentation. You're welcome. Thank you folks for doing this. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, were you going to say something? 
I can um, No, no. Um, I'm just wondering, is it so is it prudent for us to wait for the evaluation on the um, the rest of the critters to uh, before we actually, you know, maybe table this for a meeting? Um, awaiting that. I don't know what the other um, members think. Yeah, that was going to be a question I had is, what do you, what would be your, um, if Dr. Wagner's report comes back on the beetles, uh, it's, would, what would you do? If they're impact, if you're going to be impacting them. Well, in terms of Dr. Wagner's, you mean for the filing for Connecticut DEP? Right, we're waiting yeah. for the reports to come back, correct. Yes, we would file his report when we filed for storm for stormwater. Um, his initial read was that this has been agriculturally farmed for decades, and he he doesn't see you know any any habitat there. Um, but we wanted to have him go out and and examine that again. Right. Um, and I think that you know he want to look at the back mitigation areas that I think would be uh, a concern for Connecticut DEP. Um, but in terms of, I mean, certainly in terms of, of wetlands, um, we don't think the tiger beetles and the wetlands have a relationship. No. How soon is his report due in? Uh, I, I'm not sure. Um, again, we procured him for um, a Connecticut DEP filing um, because it was Natural Durst database, you know, uplands, not not particularly for this. Um, so let me ask you this. So the um, the area that you you actually mentioned that I think Lego um, at, in the in the past had created for this. That's actually not even anywhere. Is that near Watercourse uh, Area One? Is that's up there, right? It's up in the corner, right? Yeah, and right. so that's again, you know, all of those areas that um, you know originally were mitigation and that they thought they, you know, might provide some type of habitat for tiger beetle. That was done back in two thousand, I believe. Okay, but that yeah, that's not even really in the construction area. Yeah. No. no. Um, yeah. So that's not close to us. And by staying in those agricultural fields, we've pretty much avoided all of the habitat that could be possibly used by any of the species that were on that list. Hmm. Okay. That's good to know. To reiterate. Any more questions or concerns from anybody? I don't have anything. Okay. Does anybody want to make any motions or anything? Or um, hold on one sec. I like the idea that you mentioned about training the on-site crews. That yeah, I think yeah we we heard that from when we uh, we approved. I think we approved something with Win Stanley. I don't remember if it was this site or whatever, uh, but I, I remember they did that in the past yeah. as well. We did it up in um, we did it up in Great Pond up in Windsor, and yeah. um, I was so excited because. I was out there several times during construction and remediation really up there. And um, I personally was involved in the relocation of four of the box turtles. While we were out there, we encountered um, hognose snakes, which are also protected. <laughs> and DP was just like giddy all over us. And um, so it was pretty exciting, but you know, it all worked and um, the crew loved it. We had posters put up and, you know, in the trailers and, we had everybody looking out for critters. It was great. Yeah, yeah, that's a great plan. Yeah. I only have one thing, Donna. Sure. Um, I can only say, I mean, again, Win Stanley has been a good partner for Enfield. 
And I think they've done a good job with what properties they have developed for us. And so I think I can, I could trust them to do right by this piece of property. Mm -hmm. um, and from, and I went today and picked up this, this whole big thing. And I did look <laughs> at it, Lori, because I swear to God, I'm trying to learn. Um, <laughs> I did K for me. Um, you know, they've been a good partner. Good and, and I think I, I, I'm looking at this plan and, and I, it looks to me like they've waited, they waited to make the property fit within this land so that they would not have to disturb the wetlands. So um, I'm comfortable with them and I'm trusting them. So yep. my opinion. Thank you, I, I agree. <laughs> Did a great job. Um, would, uh, would there be a possibility that uh, you'd be willing to do some plantings to mitigate some of the light pollution um, that might impact the, uh, the vernal pool area? Well, if we do in fact have that vernal pool area, um, we could do plantings, but I, I think we're gonna go with the, with the uh, backlighting flanges, the retrofits of those lights, so it's, it's dark. So that would so be maybe, nice. yeah, yeah, you know, and certainly if we um, could see the uh, the new workup of the um, the modeling of that to make sure that that is the case, that would be good as well. Right. Well, Lori received, um, and Lori, it might have gotten hung up somewhere, but I'll send it again. Um, so you know, it's it, it's exponentially lower than it was. I mean, it, it it's by hundreds um we saw five and sixes and you, you know n now they're like 0.2 um and that is without the retrofit so once you put that retrofit in there there's not going to be any illumination so we okay. can we can show you that we can show you that retrofit good and uh would you be willing to uh, prepare kind of a modeling plan um, going out for a few years on that um, a monitoring plan. I didn't mean modeling um, for that vernal pool. Given that it's you know it's still in question, is it really a vernal pool? Is it not? Um, would be uh, willing to do that. Oh yeah, definitely. I think we want to go back there. You know, in the right time next March, April. Um, take a look. Um, if, if construction is underway, we would probably really uh, ramp up uh, protection and maybe come back with even some more strategies. Um, if not, like I said, I, I was out there probably, um, I would say March or April. It was still cold and it was rainy last year um, because we were entertaining another client, um, prospective tenant, dry as a bone. Um, so, Having us continue to look at that, I don't think would be an issue at all. Good, that's good. The commission has received um, the photometric plans that you sent today, and they're also on our website already. Oh, okay, those are the new ones, okay. Okay, new hire you. gets a gold star. <laughs> <laughs> that was not that question. I remember seeing that coming across, but I wasn't sure which one it was. <laughs> Tavana Nicole is on top of things. So there you go. She's posting everything as soon as we get it. Yep. Yeah, we we know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> My apologies for so many emails. <laughs> no, no, it's great. It's actually well, that's great. Good. That yeah. was good. Um, all right. And there's no uh, Lori, I guess is that questions for you or uh, Savannah Nicole? If, if um, you know, they're saying with Agrimark that there is no fueling or no truck washing, um, but we do have some unknown tenants. Is there a Would they have to come back to us if that was to happen at one of those tenants, or is that a uh, you know? Um, something we could put in here or we would need to, you know what I'm saying? Um, I think that if there was some proposed truck washing or something, then yes, you would have the right to see this again. 
okay. just because there could be more contaminants going into the uh, sediment basins. Yeah. Okay. Since, you, since they're closer. And we, and we would likely expect to come back regardless if you made us anyways, because, you know, we just don't know, can it be? We don't know the, the ins and outs. So we, we would want to share that information anyway. So, yeah. um, and technically, it would be a site mod. Let, let's say, you know, we go to plan and zoning. If we're going to add that stuff, that's technically a site plan modification. We would need your approval for that. We just can't go plopping those things down. Right. Sure. That is correct. Okay. Okay. That's good. All right. Um, then I will make a motion. Um, I'll make a motion that we approve IW number 607, application um, uh, WE 113 North Maple Street, LLC, requesting a permit to construct a distribution facility and associated improvements within the Upland Review Area at 113 North Maple Street, Map 82, merge lots 1, 2, 3, and 4 in the industrial one zone with the standard conditions and um, site specific condition of uh, continued monitoring um, of vernal pool for three years. And um, I would also like to see specific notation of snow load uh, storage areas um, on the site plan. Um, any others? The training of uh, the construction crew on identifying and relocating endangered species. Yeah, I think uh, we, I think maybe putting that the whole thing together in terms of a um, a conservation and protection plan um, for protecting the. Um, wetland area one um, as well, you know, specific to that. I think that's it. I will second it. Okay, can we have roll call, Jenny? Or any, any further discussion? Sure. Donna? Uh, yes. Donna? Yes. Yeah. Kevin? Yes. Virginia, yes. Um, Carrie Ann? Yes. Um, Marie? Yes. Marcy? Yes. yes. Robert? Yes. Seven in favor, motion passes. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Shout out to your staff again because I'm telling you. They don't get better. They don't get any better than Lori and her staff. I'm just telling you. <laughs> Especially <laughs> since we have a new one. We can, I know. <laughs> All the way to pick her in. <laughs> Thank you so much. We appreciate everything you folks do. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thanks, Thank for you. Thanks Val. We're okay. looking forward to seeing you guys uh, next week. We're planning yes. on Yes. Okay. Thank you, everyone. All right. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye now. Okay, give them a minute. So do we need to make a motion to, um, I, do we want to add to the agenda um, this? Determination of need? Yeah, determination of need. Yeah, that would be item B under determination of permit need. Okay. If we could make that motion. Yeah, I will make that motion to add that um, to the agenda this evening. Okay. Uh, 50 Hazard Ave, D is it DPN 2020-05-22, 10 no, no. Hazard Ave? No. no, it'd be 33 Sandpiper for a determination oh. of permit need. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, you're right, yeah, 33 yes. Sandpiper Road. Yeah, that'd be for, yeah. So do we have a second? Second. Got it. Hey, could you do a quick roll call, Jenny? Sure. Donna? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Virginia, yes. Uh, Carrie Ann? Do there? Carrie Ann? She's mute. You're mute. 
<laughs> Just shake your head. I'm sure she says yes. Um, <laughs> Marie? Yes. Marcy? Yes. Robert? Yes. So, Sorry, my mouse died. <laughs> there you go. So, Joy, are you saying yes? Yes. <laughs> yep. Yeah, seven in favor, motion passes to add DPN, uh, the termination of need for 33 Sandpiper Road, that'll be item B. So we have item A first, which is DPN 2020-0522, 10 Hazard Avenue, also known as 50 Hazard Avenue. Hmm. Determination of need for a proposed plus or minus 6,300 square foot expansion of a portion of the main retail strip at Brookside Plaza within the Upland Review area. Map 56, lot 22, commercial zone, uh, equity one, northeast memorial, care of Michael, Lager, Regency Centers, represented by Nate Krishner Lagan. Hope I got that right. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, for the record, my name is David Gagnon. I'm a civil engineer with Langan Engineering. Um, I'm actually going to be presenting instead of Nate tonight. I'm here okay. representing um, the applicant, uh, Regency Centers, and I have a, uh, a brief PowerPoint. If you guys had a minute, I want to run through the project. Um, we're here for a determination, determination of permit needed. Um, we do not think we're in the Upland Review, uh, but according to Town GIS, there is um, maybe some historical um, wetlands in the, in the parking area. So I want to get your opinion and kind of run through the project and determine uh, the best course of action you know, as far as the wetlands for the project. So I will share my screen. Um, okay. Right. Um, just to give everyone a brief overview of uh, what we're talking about, the project site, and, um, you know, kind of an overview of what we'll be doing. So we're talking about uh, Brookside Plaza, which is located at 50 Hazard Avenue. Um, I've also heard it called 10 Hazard Avenue, so we submitted an application under both, um, <laughs> Good idea. both locations to keep ourselves safe. But um, this is the Brookside Plaza uh, existing strip mall. Uh, it's the home of the Walgreens. There's a Pier 1 there. Um, currently, there's a, a new Chase Bank uh, being under construction in the northeast corner of the site. Um, this application is going to focus on uh, this area highlighted in yellow. Uh, towards the middle of the plaza. Um, what we're proposing is a renovation uh, of the existing um, facade over here. Uh, there's going to be a Burlington Coke factory going into the Walgreens space and adjacent retail um, spaces. Uh, this just gives you kind of a, a closer image of the area we're talking about. And uh, after I go over the existing conditions, I'll jump into our site plan um, and uh, the wetland mapping that we identified. Um, so this gives you uh, a better view of the area we're looking at. Um, our renovation is going to be the facade of the existing Walgreens and the adjacent Pier 1, which is about from this area, this area. Um, we will be expanding on the back side of uh, the existing uh, retail space. So there will be a small expansion here um, and a small expansion over in this area, totaling just over 6,000 square, uh, square feet. Um, the expansion will occur uh, in paved areas that so we will not be increasing the uh, impervious services at all on the site. Um, we will be modifying some of these landscape islands in the back. Um, so they're going to be modified, but they will be offset with new landscape spaces to make sure we're maintaining our pervious uh, coverage. Um, and the reason why we're in front of you today is um, according to the town um, GIS wetland mapping, there was wetland soils identified um, kind of through the parking lot, which historically um, this might have been true, um, but you know we don't think it's the case anymore considering it's it's been developed for years and it's um, you know it's a parking lot. So if you if you look at this line here, this wetland line, this is what was identified in the the town mapping, um, kind of through the middle of the parking lot, uh, through the shopping plaza, and out towards the back of the plaza. Um, so that's why we're in front of you today to determine if this is uh, considered a you know, a wetland if we do need a, a wetland permit, which um, we do not think is the case. Um, the, the back of the plaza, um, what we have is there's a, there's two expansions to the back of the building, totaling 6,000 square feet. Um, and that's coupled with a, um, a new loading dock. 
So currently there is a loading dock um, in this area here, which we will be shifting over to the east slightly, um, putting this area, you know, I spoke about there is a, um, a landscaped island existing in this area. Uh, to fit that loading dock, um, we had to offset that impervious or that, that landscape area with a new landscape area. So we, we added some space over here um, and we added some space over here. Um, so that's really kind of the extent of our, of our renovations in the back. Um, new facade, uh, Burlington Co. Factory is going in, slight expansion, uh, shifting the loading dock, um, adding some, you know, modifying the existing landscape areas. Um, as far as uh, drainage goes, um, as I mentioned, uh, maintaining uh, existing impervious coverage, uh, maintaining existing drainage patterns. So, um, you know, we don't anticipate any increase or change in water quality or flow. Um, and that's, you know, that's pretty much it. Um, this is what it's gonna look like in the front. Um, this would be where the existing Walgreens is. Um, and we are proposing to put a, a Burlington Coat factory there. Um, and that's pretty much it. So we have some photos too, um, if that helps people kind of conceptualize um, the area we're working in. This is the memo that we submitted. Um, these areas in green are the areas identified as um, potential wetland areas uh, in the town mapping. Um, and this would be kind of our limit of work here in the box. Um, behind us, there is a public right away and kind of a wooded lot in the back here. Um, and a couple photos to give you an idea of, of what it looks like back there. Um, so this is back of house area. Um, the expansion would be a little bit on this left side, um, a little bit on the right, totaling 6,000 square feet. This loading dock would be shifted kind of over to this area. Um, just kind of some more images of where we would be working. As you can see, it's all um, currently paved, developed, uh, impervious space where we would be putting kind of the, ex the expansion. Um, you know, just looking from some different sides. And as you can see, this is the public right away in the back. And beyond that, there is some, um, some wooded area, but that's probably at least 150 feet or so from our proposed uh, limit of disturbance. And, uh, you know, during construction, we are, you know, we do have um, all the soil erosion setup control measures in place, uh, fiber rolls, silt sacks, and, you know, construction pads, to make sure everything's done properly. Um, so that's, you know, that's our application. And if there's any questions, I will be, um, you know, happy to answer them. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions for him or? Uh, I no? don't. No, I don't either. Um, you know, I just say it is uh, already paved over. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think because we've done. Disturbed enough. Yeah, I mean, we've already done, I think when we they did the, the mobile station nearby, we had the same issue where they added the Dunkin' Donuts. I think right. if I remember right, though, we did do an application, but we did it with agent approval, if I remember right. Yeah. Would probably be a good idea. And I just want to make it clear that this is not going to, this is not an application to amend the wetlands map. No, it's yeah. not. Right, right, yeah, no, I, I don't think that's necessary. You know, it's very clearly yeah. in the report says in the opinion of this office uh, that this development is not located within the, 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 the map is right. what the map is. So. Right, yeah, Le yeah, legally but, it is, but. Right. Um, but I would I would be comfortable doing an agent approval because I you know my my only concern would be because there is some wooded areas across the street and just to make sure that the landscaped areas are um, yeah. undisturbed. Uh, re I agree well, with Kevin. well they're going to be disturbed he said but they're going to uh, mitigate that by increasing plantings elsewhere. Right. right. Are the applicants okay with that or? Yeah, I mean, just, just so I'm clear, um, for the agent approval, would I have to come back to the agency or what would be the process? No, no it's it's our staff yeah. would, it would okay. be just done through our staff, that's all. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that makes sense to us. And yeah, I mean, that the next step would be planning and zoning. So that makes, that makes perfect mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. No. All right. 
Um, okay. So I guess we need to make a motion um, that um, DPN, um, let me get the right one. <laughs> yeah, DPN number 2020-05-22, 10 Hazard Avenue, also known as 50 Hazard Avenue, um, to be approved, uh, well, to be uh, assigned agent approval um, for a wetlands application. Second. Any discussion? Nope. Okay, seeing on uh, Ginny, could you take roll call? Sure. Donna? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Virginia? Yes. Carrie Ann? Yes. Uh, Marie? Yes. Marcy? Yes. Robert? Yes. Okay, seven in favor, motion passes. So we're all set. Thank you very much for your presentation and all good right. luck. Thank you. Thank you. All right, have a good evening. Yes, you too now. Thank you very much. So give them a second. So next on our agenda is our added item, DPN. I don't know what the number would be, but um, 33 Sandpiper, Sandpiper Road for determination of permit need. And I think Raquel was gonna, Rick was gonna um, talk to us about it. You gotta unmute yourself. Gotcha, Rick. gotcha right there, okay. There you go. Uh, hey, how you doing? Good, you? Good, thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, as you may know, uh, some of these applications that we receive uh, often stem from a, a complaint and that's what took place uh, in this situation, hopefully everyone got the email that I sent out today with all the content or uh, yeah. attachment. Yep, got it. So yeah. last Thursday afternoon, late Thursday afternoon, uh, there was a complaint filed about uh, excavation going on at 33 Sandpiper Road. I tried to check it at that time. I was unable to really see anything in the backyard. So uh, Friday morning, I checked it a second time, and I actually stopped and spoke with the property owners, uh, one of which I believe is uh, Steve Parent, who is uh, appears to be logged in here. And uh, we spoke about the situation. They actually did some excavation in the backyard. They removed a deck that was uh, put on by the previous property owner without permits. And a uh, above ground pool had also been removed um, after the parents moved in. So they were in the process of doing some slight excavation in a portion of what we have mapped as uh, wetlands. And there's also an escarpment area there. Uh, so I basically uh, had them stop. I gave them the information, uh, supplied them with uh, uh, what they needed to do to get before this agency tonight to uh, determine a, uh, a needs for a permit or they want to put in a paved patio, or not a paved patio, but a patio with uh, the use of pavers. Um, yeah, that's where the deck was? Uh, yes, where the deck was, twenty by approximately 20 by 30 feet. Uh, the rear corner of the garage uh, is actually where a portion of the wetlands, according to our mapping, actually starts. And the paved area would run, then run to the, uh, would be to the west behind the house. I also asked Rick, them to, they, I'm sorry. Uh, are these going to be paving blocks or are they going to just cement the area? No, it's my understanding they're going to be paving blocks. So uh, the area will be permeable. So allow water to okay. filtrate through. They Thank also, you. I also had them put in a silk fence just for uh, the activity that was going on there. And I returned Friday after more afternoon and uh, photographed some of the pictures of, uh, of the new silk fence put in for, protection of the low-lying area there. Is, uh, is the, the owner on? I believe Steve is here. If he just needs to unmute himself. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Um, uh, 
any do you do would you like to add anything steve um no i mean uh like rick said it's a it's a paver patio with paver blocks um but the base is is crushed stone um the excavation like you said is taking place in an area that was there was a a, a deck there with a above ground pool it's that's no longer there um but beyond that we haven't really done anything to the backyard no. Cool. cool. Um, so, Rick, how, how close is this really to the uh, to the escarpment? I couldn't quite tell from the pictures. Well, there there's actually uh, it, it probably drops off uh, to the real escarpment area, probably about uh, six feet. There's a difference of about six feet, but it's that's not until there's approximately sixty or seventy feet away from the back of the house. Okay. So yeah, there's a very it. slight, very slight decline running off from the back of the house towards the, uh, uh, to the south. All right. Donna, would you feel comfortable with an agent approval on this? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking the yeah. same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, yeah, definitely. Good. Mo mostly because of the escarpment and just the, that whole area. I think it would yeah. be prudent to have a, um, a Full application and then just do an agent approval. Yep. Right, so we have some level of oversight. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. All right. I will then contact uh, the property owners tomorrow mm -hmm. and advise them of that and uh, start the process with that. Okay. Sounds good. I move that we do an agent approval for the uh, patio paving blocks at 33 Sandpiper. I second. Okay, any more discussion? Yeah. A roll call, please. Donna? Yes. Kevin? Yes. Virginia? Yes. Carrie Ann? Yes. Mar Marie? That would be yes. Marcy? Yes. Robert? Mm -hmm. Yes. You did a great job with that, Rick. Thank you. No Thank problem. you. Seven in favor, motion passes. So we're all, it'll be an application with a, uh, agent approval. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, so next on our agenda. Agenda would be number 10, which we don't have anything statewide inland wetlands activity reforms. Uh, and any enforcement reports? Any other ones? Uh, not tonight, but you may have a couple coming towards you in the near future. <laughs> uh -oh. Thanks for the warning. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Rick. Um, 12 is reported development services and plannings staff. I really don't have much else to report other than uh, I'm very happy that uh, uh, Savannah Nicole is with us, and I think she's going to be a, a great asset. All right. Great. Should should we be making a um, a motion to uh, assign Savannah Nicole as our uh, staff agent? Well, I don't know if she's certified yet. Oh, yeah, I okay. wait till her, uh, Savannah, are you supposed to get a certification in the mail or, or email or something? I have the certification um, certificate, but they're going to mail a hard copy to Enfield. Oh, okay. So I can email the commission my PDF. If okay. Why, why don't we just put that on the next agenda so it is an agenda item? Okay. That sounds good. Yeah. Okay, uh, I don't think we have any applications to be received or agent approvals, so I think we're good there. So do we have any other comments? I will make, no, uh, no. I, I will make a motion that we adjourn. Second. I second. 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 <laughs> we haven't had a meeting this long in forever. I know. Yeah, it was a good meeting. Yeah. yeah, but that's yeah, good. That means that yeah. feels moving forward. Yes, yeah. it does. You know, we're not stagnant during this pandemic. Practice. We're moving forward. That's a good sign. Yes, yeah, right. so so we'll make that motion, Kevin. 
Yep. Uh, and I yes. seconded it. Yep. Kevin and Jimmy. Okay. Seconded. <laughs> yeah. And the time is 9.24. Wow. <laughs>